Hello, comrades, and welcome to another video on the Russian Revolution area of study one. Uh, in this video, we will look at the dual the the um, the period of dual authority that ran from March to October 1917. Now, we're going to split this up into two separate videos. So, this first part outlines the first couple of months, March to May of 1917. So where we left off, uh, the February Revolution brought an end to the Tsarist regime. Uh, the provisional government holds formal power, but the Petrograd Soviet is positioned as an alternative center of power, particularly with the announcement of Soviet Order Number no. 1 on the 1st of March, um, which said that sol soldiers, or oh, that should be in blue, but never mind, soldiers will obey the orders of the provisional government so long as they do not contradict the will of the Soviet. Uh, Leon Trotsky, um, who is chairman of the Petrograd Soviet, uh, is quoted as saying, the country has so radically vomited up the monarchy that it could not even crawl down the people's throats again. Um, so the Tsarist regime is well and truly over, never to return. Power and authority, starting with the provisional government. So Pavel Milyakov, the um, cadet who um, has featured throughout uh, since the beginning of the Duma, he was um, initially the leader of the cadets. He was appointed. He appointed ministers to each cabinet post. Um, these were mostly liberal, conservative, and moderate, aside from Alexander Kerensky, who was a member of the Socialist Revolutionaries. Um, so. It's important to note here that the provisional government was not democratic. Milyakov simply appointed ministers to um, each cabinet post without any democratic processes uh, involved. Um, however, in the first few weeks of its rule, the provisional government instituted many reforms, uh, including that trade unions were recognized, an eight-hour workday was introduced for industrial workers, the Okhrana, or the um, Tsarist secret police, was abolished. Uh, capital punishment was abolished, so the death penalty. Uh, political prisoners were freed. Uh, mutinous soldiers were pardoned or um, uh, were not charged with any wrongdoing. Uh, universal suffrage was announced for all future elections. Um, and democratic local governments were established. Um, finally, and this will become relevant uh, later, preparations were made for elections of a constituent assembly. So even though the provisional government um, being provisional um, was not uh, democratic, um, preparations were made for a democratic government um, later down the line um, for a constituent assembly. So uh, an assembly of elected officials that follow a constitution. Um, Lenin described Russia after the February Revolution as the freest country in the world. So everything was looking good for Russia at this stage. Uh, the provisional government, as I just said, had no mandate to rule, i.e. they hadn't been voted in. Um, they were simply provisional. Um, so it left major issues for the consideration of the constituent assembly, such as the war, land reforms and economic reforms. Uh, Lenin's slogan, which was uh, announced um, just a month later, uh, peace spread land would become a feature of Bolshevik agitation, um, as these were areas that the provisional government did not address, leaving them instead for the constituent assembly. The second side of the dual authority was the Petrograd Soviet. So Soviet Order Number 1, while it was addressed uh, specifically to the Petrograd garrison, was widely interpreted as a direct challenge to the provisional government's authority, um, particularly around um, the... Uh, provisional government's authority over the armed forces. Um, the Soviets held enormous influence on the streets, factory floors, and barracks of the capital. Um, despite this, they resisted calls to take further legislative or legal authority. Um, they were quite happy at this stage for the provisional government to have um, authority, um, but... Uh, they were basically hold, um, holding their time. That's not the right phrase. You know what I mean. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have the two. Uh, sorry, I've completely forgotten how to use words. We um, they had the we had the two uh, 
powers, the provisional government, and the Petrograd Soviet. Now, according to Marxist theory, the SRs and SDs believe Russia had entered its bourgeois democratic stage of development. So remember about historical materialism. Um, Marx outlined a um, clear stage of history um and between feudalism and socialism there had to be a stage of capitalism so the srs and sds believe that russia had now entered this stage um here are a couple of quotes about the petrograd soviet the first one comes from alexander kerensky um and this is him speaking uh retrospectively about um the period of dual authority um so he actually as we'll find out um later in this video or the next video, he um, lived a, a long life. Uh, and so he reflected on this period. And he said that the Soviets had power without authority, the provisional government authority without power. Um, Alexander Guchkov um, said, one can say flatly that the provisional government exists only so long as it is permitted by the Soviet. That alludes to Soviet order number one, where if the Soviet decides that the provisional government needs to go, then they have control over the um, Petrograd garrison and um, widely interpreted as the army. Lenin's return to Russia. So during the February Revolution, many revolutionary leaders were absent, uh, either imprisoned or exiled. Um, Lenin struggled to make it back to Russia through German-occupied territory. He had been in uh, Switzerland. Um, and so arrangements were made for him to travel by train through German territory in a sealed carriage. Um, this was organized by some Swiss comrades. Uh, on the journey, Lenin composed his thoughts on the political situation in Russia, and this would become known as his April Theses, um, which is the, the which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, the train arrived at Petrograd's Finland station, not in Finland, it's just called Finland station in Petrograd, uh, on the evening of the 3rd of April 1917, where crowds of workers and soldiers awaited uh, Lenin's home homecoming alongside a delegation of Soviet leaders, hoping Lenin would support Russia's new democracy. So members of the Soviet and leaders of the Soviet wanted Lenin to back the provisional government. Um, Lenin was not so keen. Uh, he's, I should mention even um, members of the Bolsheviks who arrived back before Lenin, such as Stalin, um, uh, put their support behind the provisional government. Um, Lenin ignored the desires of the leaders and delivered a speech at Finland Station. He said, comrades, soldiers, sailors, and workers, the imperialist war is the beginning of civil war throughout Europe. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution. Now, the imperialist war refers to World War I um, and civil war. He doesn't mean war within Russia. He means class warfare. That's what he means by civil war. So he was not throwing his support behind the provisional government. Here's a um, painting of Lenin's arrival at Finland Station in Petrograd. We can see soldiers holding up their hats in support. We see lots of guns. We've, we see horns. So it was a big celebration, red flags, banners, um, a big celebration by workers and soldiers upon Lenin's return. The April Theses. So here's a quote from Lenin directly from the April Theses. Our tactics, absolute distrust. No support for the provisional government. That seems pretty clear. Um, so on the 4th of April, 1917, Lenin addressed an assembly of Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Um, his April theses, which he had written on the train back from um, Switzerland, um, denounced the capitalist nature of the provisional government and its continued commitment to uh, the war. He said that the Bolsheviks should offer no support for the provisional government. Uh, most Marxists accepted the February Revolution as a necessary step on the way to communism, but Lenin argued for a second revolution that would place power in the hands of the workers. Um, he wanted this revolution to be international and socialist. Um, some Bolsheviks uh, who did support the provisional government left the party while others wholeheartedly supported Lenin's thesis. Um, now, his thesis could be boiled down to three clear and digestible slogans for the masses, and these are worth remembering. We've got the first one, peace, bread, land. These, This is just a 
call to address the main issues facing Russia. They wanted Lenin wanted peace, i.e., to exit World War One, uh, bread for the starving workers and peasants, uh, and land reform for the peasants. Um, he also said, turn the imperialist war into to a civil war, civil again meaning class, and finally, all power to the Soviets. None of this shared power, none of this dual authority, all power to the Soviets. The Declaration of War Aims. So on the 14th of March, um, the Petrograd Soviet issues an appeal to the peoples of the world. Um, this sought an end to the war and put pressure on the government to declare its own war aims. Um, different ministers had different views. Kerensky wanted to try try exiting the war, while Milyakov wanted to continue the war through to victory. So on the 27th of March, the provisional government's declaration of war aims was released, and it was sort of cryptic. It wasn't very specific on, um, on its aims. <clears throat> it said the Russian people is not seeking the reinforcement of its external power at the expense of other nations. Uh, but the Russian people will not allow its native land to emerge from the Great War humbled. Does that mean it's exiting the war? Does it mean it's staying in the in the war and through to victory? Um, it was slightly unclear. So Milyakov, concerned that the declaration might lead the Allies to assume that Russia intended to withdraw from the war, drafted a note on the 18th of April, which was to accompany copies of this declaration as it was sent to international press and international leaders. Um, his note confirmed the government's desire to bring the world war to a decisive victory. People were not happy. This led to public uproar. Um, people were furious. They wanted to leave the war. Um, it was part of the reason that the February Revolution had happened in the first place. Um, so uh, the provisional government's de um, declaration to stay in the war, brought about by Milyakov's note, um, made uh, led to a public uproar. This led to the April crisis. From the 20th of April, so two days after Milyakov's note, there were massive protests against Milyakov and against Russia's continued involvement in the war. Uh, Lenin was cautious in his approach to the April crisis, feeling that the time was not right for an all-out attack on the government. Um, this crisis brought new supporters to the Bolsheviks and made Lenin's April theses more attractive. As I said, people wanted out of the war, and Lenin's April theses um, made it clear that the Bolsheviks also wanted to exit the war. They wanted peace. Uh, the commander of the Petrograd garrison wanted to use troops to disperse the crowds, but Prime Minister Lvov wanted to avoid using violence to stop the protests and instead sought the help of the influential Petrograd Soviet. Again, an example of this dual authority, dual power. Um, the unrest came to an end when the Soviet Executive Committee issued a three-day ban on all demonstrations and ordered soldiers to not leave their barracks unless instructed by the Soviet. Another example of the Soviet wielding enormous influence. Um, by the 23rd of April, the streets were calm. So this was a brief crisis um, that ended with the Soviet uh, telling the um, demonstrators to go back home. The April crisis led to the resignation of Minister of War Guchkov, um, who would be replaced by Alexander Kerensky, as well as Minister of Foreign Affairs Milyakov. Uh, it was his note that led to the April crisis, so um, he resigned. Uh, Prime Minister Lvov urged Soviet leaders to join the government, wanting to try and ease tensions. And on the 5th of May, six socialists agreed to join a coalition government. Uh, this second incarnation of the provisional government was known as the first coalition uh, government. Now, here's a long quote from historian Orlando Fage. Um, I'll emphasize the important information. So the formation of the coalition, which had been intended to reinforce the democratic center, had the opposite effect. That's important. It accelerated the political and social polarization that led to October. On the one hand, most of the provincial rank and file of the cadets moved with their party leader Milyakov into right-wing opposition against the coalition government. Increasingly, they abandoned their liberal self-image as the party of the nation as a whole and began to portray themselves as a party for the de defense of bourgeois class interests, property rights, law and order, and the Russian empire. <clears throat> 
So the cadets who had been progressive liberals were becoming more conservative and bourgeois in their attitudes. Uh, within the Soviet camp, on the other hand, there was a steady drift to the left as the mass of the workers and peasants became increasingly disillusioned with the failure of the socialists to use their position in the government to speed up the process of social reform or to bring about a democratic peace. The initiative for the revolution, for bread, land and peace, was taken up by the Bolsheviks. So at this point, the Bolsheviks are becoming more and more popular. The SRs and the Mensheviks slightly less so, as they are the ones that agreed to join the coalition government, and the um, cadets are becoming more right-wing. So that brings us to the end of this first part on the um, dual period of dual authority. Uh, the next part will go from June to October 1917. Uh, I hope you found this video interesting and useful, and I will see you next time.